Hello and welcome to Control Alt Event. Let me introduce my co-host because I forgot my words and I've got a lovely day that everything goes wrong. So uh, let's see what's happening today. Uh, it's uh, Morain Van Buren, who is the co-founder at uh, Event Mender. He has worked with uh, hundreds of both event professionals and with uh, event technology. He's your guy when it comes to integrations, to anything about platforms, all the little little details that you need to know and the big details. And yeah, I'll just hand it to you and shut up for the rest of the half an hour, I think. <laughs> Don't worry at all. Thank you so much, Bogdan. And thank you all for joining Control Alt Event, the show where we navigate the future of events with practical insights and real solutions. And I'm obviously joined by an amazing individual, whether he makes mistakes or not, aka our uh, masterful data storyteller. He has an amazing track record of integrating and building bespoke platforms, captivating data visualizations, and much more. He's the founder of Visual Hive, an AI-driven marketing engine tailored for marketers and event professionals. And if you're seeking expertise in video and data strategy, personalized solutions, or anything related to AI, look no further because it's Bogdan. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, obviously, let us know where you're joining in from. Today, we have a very entertaining session uh, that is about everything from emotion to engagement, technology, and the sweet spot in between. We have an amazing guest for you. So don't wait all the way to the end. We only have these 30 to maybe 40 minutes if we run out a little bit. So make sure to already drop your co comments, drop your questions in the chat, and we'll make sure to address them during this session. Well, who is the amazing guest that we have for today? You might be wondering, but if you have seen the picture of this event, you know it's no one less than Claire Forrestier. Well, if uh, you are not familiar with who Claire is, she says that her goal is to look after the audience uh, at events and make even the most complex, complex and driest subjects accessible to everyone. She also uses the skills picked up in her previous career as a BBC journalist to help others improve their presentation skills, talk to the media. She's described by her clients as a charismatic, no-nonsense and lots of fun. Claire admits she is a little bit obsessed with prioritizing the attendee experience, which is a very good thing. Uh, and that's exactly why she is the perfect match for this session, balancing emotion, engagement, and technology for a successful event. Thank you so much for joining us today, Claire. Muted. Am if I still you're muted? Here. Nope, you're <laughs> Who <good>. muted me? <laughs> That's another bog down tech disaster. <laughs> Most probably. Look, I've been married for 10 years. It's always my fault. So yeah, it's definitely It doesn't matter what happens. <laughs> I love that quote. I love that quote. It's brilliant. Lovely to be here. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm not touching the tech today. It's totally you. Um, because even though... I love the idea of technology. We were just saying I'm not so good at applying it. And that's exactly why it's a good match for today, because we're finding that sweet spot and it's good to have someone completely on the engagement and personal side and also some insights from a tech perspective and figuring out where is that sweet spot. Do you always need technology? Probably not. But in which cases do you need it and how can you implement it? And in general, what strategies do people need in order to create an engaging event. So today we'll talk a little bit about the role of technology in event engagement, designing interactive and inclusive agendas, simplifying technology for everyone and the long-term value of tech integration where it's needed and where you can benefit from it. Claire, I would love to start with your perspective uh, in terms of your experiences as an MC, as a moderator. Um, do you use technology? Where do you use it? Where do you not use it? What's kind of your perspective on today's topic? Well, I, I think of it like, you know, my perspective is if, if I'm the MC of an event, I have been hired to look after the audience. So to help the organizers, the client to deliver the emotions that we want the attendee to experience so that then we can deliver on the objective behind the event. So I'm interested in technology in as far as it does that. This, that's the simplest point of it. So it is not, you know, maybe like you guys, tech for tech's sake, because you just love tech. It is literally the tech has to deliver 
the thing. It is not the thing for me. Um, and that's where I kind of, actually, that's where I go in life, but it's also where I go in events. So people go to events because they want community, they want to be heard, they want to share, they want to learn. Um, and then those things are going to make them happy and excited and inspired. And then they're going to go off and do whatever it is that we wanted them to do when they came to the event. The reason that we got them there, um, buy, invest, partner, or go off and evangelize about the company. Um, so it, whatever I want the attendee to do, whatever emotion I want them to do, then I'm going to invest in technology that would help me to do that. Or I'm going to tell my client to invest in the technology to help them do that. Um, so any kind of technology that's around engagement and connection is is going to be something that would be considered. But then it's I also struggle when I see people think, oh, yeah, I've got to get engagement. So we'll get this app or we'll get this piece of tech because that does it. But it's actually not necessarily always needed, as you said, you know, is that going to get the attendee to do what we want them to do? And I think sometimes people go, oh, we've got to do this. That's like a shopping list. That's what everybody else is doing. We've got to do it. You know, the, the obsession over an app that might be a small event doesn't actually need an app. And you'll spend so much time on that and not actually get an attendee that's even going to use it or like it. And I feel really bad because I know um, there's people's industries and lives. But I've got to the point where sometimes I don't even download the app because I've got so peed off with them at previous events, which is terrible because, of course, the, the technology is moving on and the, and the, and the um, app might actually be really good now. But last year it was terrible, so I don't want it this year. That's kind of my mentality. So it's very different. I always thinking, how's the attendee going to get benefit from it? Um, you know, it's just like, again, people go, well, we must have a polling app. We must have a questions and a chat app. And again, if you've got an audience who actually never needed that, do you need to give it to them? Um, it's that kind of thing. So really making sure that the tech is super intentional and actually valid for that specific event is is kind of the really big thing for me. And I think in that regards, the tech is can be an enabler. But as you mentioned, if you don't have that idea of why you need to use it in the first place because some just struggle to understand what it is they want to bring to their audience i think you bring it up in your linkedin post as well quite often where organizers sometimes just miss that first step in terms of understanding what do i want to have enabled with what do i want to enable in my audience what kind of emotion do i want to provoke what kind of what, what do i want them to take with them how do i want them to feel after the event and if you don't know those things then it's very hard and indeed many people just resort to oh i heard the other org organizer is adding a q a um, we have to have a tool like that but i think indeed as you mentioned taking that step first uh, back and and see what you really need to do is is more important than just getting a quick technology fix that may or may not be a, a good match for what you want to achieve. Yeah, I mean, I always remember someone saying to me, oh, you know, we what's what's the tech out there that you've seen that's really going to wow our audience? And I was like, oh, that's that's where it's been completely missed because it isn't the tech that's going to wow them. It's the, the thing that is delivered that's going to wow them. So the tech could be really kind of unexciting, actually. It can be sometimes the least exciting piece of technology is going to create the wow because it's going to give them a chance to talk or to share or to I don't know think of a word you know I mean even sometimes just those word clouds that can be the one I've seen people go oh wow you know and that's like a really simple piece of tech but it's what did you want in that moment the tech to do or at the event and then that's the wow but it's it gets lost in the, you know, in the everything else has got to happen, got to do this, got to add. And it's sort of things become a little checklist, don't they? As opposed to taking it back all the time to the objective for the attendee. Very true. Bogdan, is uh, there anything you would like to add to? Uh... Apart, I'm, I'm scared <laughs> I'm going to destroy everything. No, but it, you're <laughs> absolutely right about the enablement. And I think as geeky as we are and as good as we, 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 as much as we love tech and we try to apply that because it's kind of our, day job technically speaking it's we, we tend to work with clients to tell them not to use everything or at least to use the simple things because they are very efficient and the con the funny conversation is when they don't want to and then they blame the technology for something that is not working when they for example especially around engagement they want everybody to use their phones but they're not 
don't have any Wi-Fi. I'm not talking about actually the audience wanting to engage with the phone at all in, in some perspectives, but they don't have anything like that. And the other way around, where when you would need something more than just when you have 10,000 people and you want them to ask questions or you want to see what their opinion is, you cannot do that physically, regardless how good you are as an MEC or whoever is on that stage to facilitate all this conversation. They won't be able to do that. So you would need that tech to enable you to hit your goals to a certain degree. Absolutely. And then that's it. That's when it's fantastic, when it's a really big audience and when there's an audience in lots of different places. But again, if you've got 100, I don't know, 50 people in the room, do you need to be faffing about with an app? And actually, if you've got a small event and it's very, the whole point was it to be very collaborative and very, people have come to physically meet people, do you want them on their phones or not? It is just applying it intelligently to the specific event. And I think the problem is, you know, we know you invest in a piece of technology, you kind of almost want to rinse it, don't you? You want to get your money's worth. So you're like, I'll just shove that into every event I do. And it just might not be relevant for this particular event. And again, if if it is an audience that really doesn't need an engagement tool, then you don't need to give it to them. And if it is one that that does, then absolutely go full ball. We know that this particular audience isn't terribly um, happy about raising their hand. So let's give them another forum where they can be heard that isn't awkward for them. It is literally every time, who is my attendee? What do they want to feel? And what do I want them to do? And does this technology enable that? And if it doesn't, then don't buy I, it. I, I love, I can tell where the Ws are coming from, from because I, I've I've spent some time in the, in the in, well, as a journalist, photojournalist to be honest, not necessarily speaking or writing, but those doubles always fit within everything, including technology. And I'm surprised when people come up, where did you come up with this idea? And like, it should be like the back ben bench of anything you do. Have you asked those questions? Why do you do this? How do you do this? When do you do this? To whom do you address this? And so on and so on and so on and so yeah. on. Who, what, why, where, when, yes. Yes. And I think that also ties in perfectly to actually the designing of interactive and exclusive agendas. I think that's the, the first step, but maybe Claire, I know you always help you, the, the people you work with, your clients in terms of when you act as an MC and a moderator to actively help them and guide them into designing that interactive and inclusive agenda. And as far as well, I try. For it. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Yeah. what would you like to give our audience as in how can they start with designing an interactive and inclusive agenda to make sure that, you know, those whys and whens they are captivated by the agenda? Uh, well, obviously, you know, that key thing we've just been banging about for about 10 minutes is your objective. What are you trying to do? Um, if you clearly know what you want them to do at the back of it, then you, it's almost like a little path. It's like, that's how we're going to get there, you know, working backwards, but also being a little bit brave and saying, just because we've always done it this way, you know, the same as last year principle that seems to apply very heavily within events, which is we've done it this way, we'll do it that, that way. And, and I can see that's why people end up with tech that they don't need because you've gone, this is last year's agenda, right? We're going to replicate that, boom, 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 plenary here, boom, 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 this here, that there, exactly the same. Oh, they didn't like, they didn't ask any questions of that one. It was super orcs, let's chuck in an, an engagement tool. It, it's almost like that's what they're doing. They're like fixing things that might not have been quite right, but without actually going, is that going to get the attendee to do it? Is that going to work? It's almost, we have so much information now, like there's all the data, which is probably kind of sounds really sad, but it's maybe the sexiest side of tech is the data that you get that that you can then change with, except nobody seem nobody, that's not fair. Lots of people don't seem to be doing that. Like they're getting all this technology, um, data technology, sorry, data from the tech, <clears throat> and then they're not doing anything with it. <laughs> um, so that's my kind of point is, you, I've lost my point, but and I feel like I'm like I'm doing what Brian did. No, 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 you got into data and then you got me all excited. <laughs> I got to data, I got you excited. I, I, no point I, apart from that, it's absolutely fine. Everything <laughs> is okay. <laughs> yeah, I got, I, who do I think I am? Shut up, Claire, talking about data. But no, I don't even know how to read the data to do that, but I know it is giving you that stuff so that you don't need to go, well, do we, and it should then be saying, do we even need a plenary session there? Did that, was that what we needed? Was that what the issue was? So you can change it. So my thing to people is to start querying all that, go back into everything you've done and query, is that needed based on what we now know about our attendee? Um, and do we still need to queue exactly the same way that we did last year? And actually also, you don't even have to be looking at your old data. There's enough out there now to say that the attendee 
needs much more than just the same old, same old, because we now understand human beings. We now understand psychology better. There are people specializing in event psychology. So listen to them and say, does that get the result we want by doing it the same way we've always done it? I mean, isn't it the definition of, isn't it the definition of failure or no, whatever, to keep doing the same old thing and expect the same and then expect a different result. That's the word. Um, yep. that's something I quote to my husband all the time, but I've forgotten the quote. Um, <laughs> I know I've been quoted this quite a few times. By I mean, really? <laughs> yes. Definition of insanity. That's it. Yes, yes. The definition yes. of insanity is to be trying to get a new result. So something better from your from your event, because every year we've got to get the bums on the seats. There's more and more competition. Yes, there's lots of events, but that struggle to get people to commit um, the sort of flakiness of attendees and, and generally in life, society seems to be more flaky. We commit to things, um, we say yes to things and then we don't commit. So you've got that harder job now of getting people to come to your event and to commit to it and to maybe even when they sign up to then follow all the way through and actually turn up. So you've got to work harder. So you can't just keep applying the same old stuff. So the first thing I would say with the design is strip it all back and go, do I need all this stuff? Do, they, do these terms work? Do, does this kind of system work? You know, and they've gone, oh, look, keynotes are too long and boring, so we'll make them shorter. That seems to have got through. Um, but, you know, for some people, that feels like that's about as groundbreaking as they're going to get. They've shortened their keynote. Um, so <laughs> it's stripping it back and starting to ask questions again. And does, does this make sense just because we've always done it? It's probably my first tip with design. So it took me a very long time to get there. No, but can I disagree with you on one tiny point that you said at the beginning that you don't know how to read that data? I think it's not about reading that data, it's about interpreting that data and having stakeholders like yourself who has a specific experience or having a pool of stakeholders with different experiences, you being one of them that looks at the data and say, okay, from this perspective, from my perspective of designing an agenda, we should do this because this works better. And that's, for example, my job as a geeky data guy is to, put that data in a format that you can interpret yeah. and reach a conclusion because I don't have your experience. I don't have your context. I don't have the years of journalism. I don't have the hours and hours of sitting on a stage and actually going through that, searching that emotion in, in the public, in, in, in the audience. So data, yes, is fascinating, but it's about the interpretation. So that's where I don't yeah. disagree. I think you'd be, when you're good at your job, data just helps you a little bit more just to give you the extra nudge. Well, I'm, I'm working with a client at the moment who I've done events with them for, I did one event with them last year and we're doing another one. And I love that they've really, like with me, straight after the event last year, they well, straight soon after, we looked at what was found, where we'd gone, oh, where, where, they, where they want to change. And then we sort of thought about it. And so when we met up again a few months later, we had some ideas and they came to me and they're with a quite a traditional group of people. They've done the similar event for a long time. But they were saying, so we want to change the wording because people say they don't want, but we don't just want to change the wording. We need to make something different happen in it. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. They know that people are put off by networking event, but they know that people in another part of the survey said we want to meet the right people. So they realized that, you know, they weren't just going to relabel it. God, I don't know whether we come up with collaboration or whatever the word was they were going to have to change it within it and do it. So that's that's what I'm talking about. It's just those little things. And then you can go, do we need tech to do that? As if we get staying on the tech. Yes, we do actually, because one of the things that could make it more fun is to give them all something to find out about each other. And we could do that with a poll or we could do that with this app. Or, you know, that's when it starts to become, oh, you can see everyone's threaded it together to get to the right point. Very true. And I think Levin is pretty much asking exactly this. Like he believes a lot of the excitement was lost during the whole PC word situation that we had and have endured. Um, and is asking like, how do we build back the total excitement and confidence in life events? Um, you already touched upon it a little bit, but maybe you want to uh, direct. The, well, maybe the, I, it might be a bit controversial. It's, it's a bit <laughs> it might be a bit controversial, but I think a lot of those events didn't even blimmin' have it before COVID, to be honest. I mean, I came into this industry, I was in a totally different industry, and I came in and started going to business events going, God, they're a bit, really, they're a bit rubbish um, because they're just the same old, same old, and I'm running around and I'm exhausted and I haven't got 
the benefit out of this expensive event that I should have that I could have done if they just not put so much in and made it different and you know all the other stuff we talk about or I rant about for hours on LinkedIn and so I was thinking what well, post COVID everyone's learned so much now we'll come back in and it will be better and I've been shocked by how same samey it is you know we're four years post COVID now which freaks me out when you think about it because we just kind of like to blame everything we are four years on it and our, some of the events are still exactly the same they just chucked a bit of apping apping a bit of an app in there or a bit of a polling platform and they've made this system the um sessions shorter and they've made question q a a bit longer otherwise they are still very similar and i'm sure you would agree with me because we go to some of the same events they don't seem that different sorry uh, <laughs> no no they don't seem that different and it's uh, i think for me coming from a different industry as well before the pandemic, just before the pandemic, and going and saying, we can do better. I, I, I've seen these examples in various other industries, including the event industries. If you look like, for example, at if you look at engagement and you look at uh, 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 esports events, where you, the logic of it just baffles my mind. And I'm a gamer by definition, because I, keep, I play more than 80 minutes a day, a game, regardless what the game is. You go there and you, Go in a stage to watch some people play on screens, literally do that. And it's not that it's crazy and everybody's excited. The amount of engagement and the use of technology, because not everybody's on, on, on their phones, but they have phones because usually you don't, you don't, you don't have any 70 plus year olds going there in terms of major audience. But the way they engage with, with the audience, the way they engage with the audience post-event, the way they engage with the audience before the event, the way they enable them to share content, the way, yeah. the, the, not just content, but the emotion that they feel there. I haven't really seen any business events. And yes, I don't expect big screens, firecrackers, and probably some horses running around at any point. But the, ex the examples on engagement and sharing the emotion are quite good and they are quite nice. And my point, which was very long with it, was that I think events are crucial, but before the pandemic or the C word, uh, we didn't have any other option. There was no op other option to play. We have to go to, I don't know, Confex and that's it because that's in London and we have to go there. We have to go to wherever we need to go within our industries. But now we actually, we are actually just looking for, looking for the value more than just being there. Yeah, and 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 you're exactly right to use the points there. Like the sports industry and the gaming industry, broadcast industry was doing this long before. You know, literally, <clears throat> it was so important. I worked in news; that's my background. And you know, now it's got to the point where literally the news is almost decided by what everybody's liking on Twitter. Kind of, it feels like that. Which you know, I a, a traditionalist, I could be like, well, you know, that's. That means that the audience, the general public is deciding what's interesting. And that's why you'll see a depletion in the amount of foreign news and, and potentially useful information that people might need. You might say they should know this. It's not necessarily being reported because they're not as interested in it. So you end up in this vicious circle where we live in little echo chambers. So there's a there's a problem there. But that idea of getting user generated content and that idea of getting people to respond and phone ins and call ins and all that kind of stuff was that's been going on for so much longer than it has been in events. And that is where I think we're really behind. And that and now the tech is there now. It needs to be being used. Yeah, you've got both the tech and the data to prove it. Historical as well, if you want to go through that, the TV thing. Very true. And I think in, in the gaming example specifically, it's very tailored to that audience. They are very tech yes. enabled, so it's tech yeah. focused all the way. Um, in, in a post that, you know, um, Tamar uh, actually, uh, for those of you who know her, uh, also posted that where she asked kind of the same, like what's, what's the reason why people going screaming to a taylor swift concert but they're not screaming running to <laughs> yeah. a, a business corporate event <laughs> and i believe it's a lot about first understanding your audience but also understanding what kind of experience they want because the reason why people go to a taylor swift is because this is an amazing experience they are a fan they can finally see their idol their life the amazing experience so that's all tailored to that particular audience but in an business setting it's a lot more about the kind of basics where it's not wow i'm super excited to go there maybe there's one person that i really like to see or you know catching up with my friends and and that that's amazing but 
there is a lot more experience we can add to it. So, uh, Lewin, I think we uh, dove quite deep into your topic, but I, I think there's a lot of points where we as an industry, we have some track record that we have to prove we can do it a lot better. And then uh, to the points that have been mentioned, it's a lot about tailoring that experience to what people expect and making sure it is a real experience rather than quote unquote, uh, a flat event. Well, we go to a business event sometimes because we should. We know we should. We should. We're going to meet people. I should go there. I'm going to should network. I should. I should. Which is never, you know, when you the shoulding in life is just so boring, isn't it? Um, you want to go because you want, like, I'm a Bruce Springsteen fan. I want to go, even though I've seen him loads of times, I want to go because that experience, trying to get to the front, hanging out with your friends, the whole, everything, the whole the whole hours and days of queuing and all, you know, it's it's the, it gives you that amazing buzz. And actually, more of you saying I shouldn't go because it's expensive, it's wasting time, whatever. But it's it's exciting. And I want my business events to be like that. And I want to get the maximum from it. And I want to know that if I didn't see something at that business event, when I go home, I can watch it again. I can get all that element from it. And then it feels really valuable. And that's when the technology is there to help you. And it's also someone mentions there it's so much more inclusive it's so much more inclusive uh, can i just add quickly first of all yes yes to bronze please but we are going <laughs> to a concert so you're you're choosing the concert you're going because i would never go to a taylor swift concert no, but i would go to uh, springsteen for example or uh, i know red hot chili peppers or something to that degree that makes me happy but that's the keyword it makes me happy so it gives some value back it's not something that i have to do because my kid cannot go there she's 14 and i went to some very weird concerts where a lot of teenagers screaming for about two and a half hours i had to otherwise she wouldn't go there so i love her but I, I i want to say that i found that for example with event tech live i get the same emotional <laughs> experience because i go there to apart from educating because it's your church watching, yes i i go there because it's it's it brings me joy and it brings me it gives me the energy to go on for another few months and to think of ideas and to bring that on and to it takes you out of the house a little bit you go to the fox now not into shoreditch but anyway that's kind of the thing but it fills you with energy and i cannot say i found that in other shows no. industry specific no well, I actually think some of the events in the events industry are probably the worst events, which is ironic. Ironic. <laughs> let, let, let's not uh, shame too many people here, but um, I do agree. There's quite a few things that can be improved uh, in, in general in, in terms of running events and addressing that particular issue. Um, when we're talking about technology and that being uh, something that can help where it is, uh, it fits. Uh, something that actually came up in one of our first episodes was someone who said like, yeah, great, all that technology, but my audience, for instance, is all um, yeah. 60 plus. Uh, they they have no clue how to use technology. And I think there it's also, you can use technology, but if it's if it's right for the goal, but it's not right for the audience, it will still not be a good match. And that's something that kind of Bob mentioned in, in his question. He says yeah. like, are event text really include uh, event apps really inclusive for example design colors layout for visual impairment uh, but in general technology it can be overwhelming and there it's very important to also simplify that technology um, any tips and tricks that you know well, of, it, like we it, we would be happy to join. you but when you brought it may not, i mean i am that sort of person that i i do some volunteering and when i go out volunteering they it's um it's a different kind of phone you know i've got a, an, an apple and they use a i don't know another android and i literally am like mm -hmm, for about 10 minutes trying to get it to work and it's there for an emergency and i think well if there's an emergency i'm never going to use that because it would take me about 10 minutes to work out how to turn it on let alone dial 999 now okay i'm well, I might be generic of lots of people who go to events. I mean, I'm as tech, I'm more technical than some, but less technical than others. That interface, it doesn't look like anything I understand, really annoys me and wastes my time. And if I'm busy at an event and I'm trying to use an app and I like, don't even understand the interface, and then I see the whirly gig for about five hours, I'm like, no, not going to do it. And then, and then I'm pissed off. P dot, well, I could swear it's not, not national telly. Um, and then I'm annoyed because I can't see who's coming and I want to find someone and I wanted to message them. And, and I'm just generally frustrated and then I'm angry and then I'm not actually in a mind to take in stuff. So it is really important to get that right. You can't make it look like how everybody wants everything to look. You're never going to make everyone happy. But why is there not a sort of 
okay, I'm sure it's a, a little bit of a standard on what things look like and where things are. It's like you get in a car if you're driving in the UK, you know what side the um God, look, I've listened to me at the time of day. The handbrake. I really hope you know yes, where, which side is because it happens from time to time. Yeah, but, it's, but if it's on another side, you're like, what? Yeah. Or if you get in an electric car and you're like, the key doesn't turn. I'm supposed to type something in. It freaks you out. And obviously with a car, you've got to spend time getting out. But you're just going to go, no, I can't do it. And then you're going to be disengaged from that element of the event. So it is super important to keep things a little bit standardized in the sense of where things are going to expect them to be. You know, expect the key to be there. You ex It's like when you go into somebody else's kitchen and you're like, why are they keeping their knives and forks over there? It's ridiculous. Um, and that's what, <laughs> that's what I'm meaning. No, but <laughs> you're right. It should be an enabler and it should be designed not for those who know how to use technology, but for, for those who need to use it or that enables them to use it because I, I would get around maybe not for 10 minutes, but it will take me a little bit to remember how to use the iPhone because I'm on an Android, but I'm a geek and I'll, I'll sort things out. I'll automate free apps in the between and that's it. But that's apps shouldn't be designed for me or any, no, anybody and that's the thing. That, with that mindset, because it's, that's not, that, 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 that's not the point of the whole conversation. Yeah. As you much as make it for the true. people who are going to use it. And, <laughs> If they don't know how to use it, make sure they can be trained on how to use it or they can get helped using it. You know, internal conferences, God, great. You know, you, you can make them. They work for you. You can give them that training so that they've understood it. You can help them understand it. Um, and I, you can still do that to a certain degree within any event. You know, if you're going to be using a piece of tech and you explain to people, this is going to make this event so important and helpful and useful to you. Could you spend 10 minutes doing it? It generally people might be more inclined to do it if they understand the value to them by doing so. So communication, basically. Yeah. Better communication, way better communication yeah. on all aspects. But that's all. The, that's so important to be communicating with your attendee long before they come. Anyway, it's all just like another another part of the community building, which you know obviously is not so much for this conversation. But we know that's really valuable, and you you can then get there. They can be getting involved because you're asking them to do stuff before the event to share and to contribute. That's helping them become familiar with the technology you're going to be using, so that when they arrive, they feel, oh yeah, I'm part of all this. I'm part of the community. I get what's going on. It's all it all helps. Yes. Can I just add that sending an email with a link does not mean that you explain how technology works just for, for my <laughs> Nobody mind. opens it anyway. <laughs> Very good point. And I think like when you start to craft that inclusive agenda, it's good to have kind of a, a small group of representatives of your ideal attendee profile to, to test things with and to, to try things out. And this is something where you can also then do a very smart, small test run Say like, hey, this is the event up. What you know, I want you to connect with a, a fellow peer. Go ahead and see how they interact and see where the mistakes are, so you can maybe improve the interface, delete a certain feature that no one understands from that group what it what it is for that doesn't seem to have a purpose. Understand their questions, turn that into a frequently asked questions page where then yeah. on the day of the event you can educate everyone who will probably have the more or less similar problems um, to also go through that. And that's where it doesn't have to be with the whole event. You can do it. Maybe there's a small event or you, do, you have a, a small experience or you just do a testing group. You can already get your answers in terms of where people will run into and make sure you, you troubleshoot that before the event even starts. And I think that also yeah, I don't mind being a type person that needs asking. Look, if she can do it, anyone can do it. Like, let's make sure we get we get a Claire, <laughs> you know, slightly, you know, yeah, woman who can't remember words after three o'clock, um, person, and just get them to see if they can use it. Exactly, that is so important. Everybody needs a Claire. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. That's another. That's another podcast. I think we are obviously flying through time as always, which is amazing because there's a lot of insights here and a lot of things people can learn. One of the things that I was very curious about is in terms of your own experience, what type of technologies or experience where technology was involved, do you feel have been very successful? And do you think maybe more event professionals could consider or think about if it's a right match for the audience? Yeah. I mean, Again, it's always going to be the ones for me that will encourage people who might not otherwise have taken part to take part. That That's when it's 
really been incredible. You know, you have seen events where there wasn't a lot of interaction. And that isn't because people don't want to interact. It's because almost people are institutionalized into thinking they don't. Because I think events for a long time have been like school um, in the sense that I went to, you know, I'm older, way older than you guys. And I went to very traditional school. And it was so like the olden days, you know, practically like Tom Brown's school days, you know, with wooden chairs and desks and all of that. And teachers just lecturing the same old stuff that they did for years and years, and no real contribution entitled from you apart from your homework, and no collaborative and no like lovely now with all the collaborative whiteboards and everything. So old fashioned school is what a lot of events were. So people didn't necessarily get involved and be interactive because they weren't expected to and sometimes when you try and do that in an event they look at you horrified when you do that you know even just to asking the audience a question they're like are you kidding me it's nine o'clock in the morning I'm drinking coffee I'm not talking to you you know and it's not that they don't want to because we know human beings want to it's just that they've been used to that not happening in an event so then I see and they see the event organizers go no no we have to do that we have to get we have to get um interaction and we have to get all of that and they're like oh audience they don't like it they're really shy they don't know like, they're not shy and they're none of those things they're just not used to it and so then you're having the technology that helps them come out of their shell and bit go well can ask a question no one's looking at me I don't have to stand up for this but then I think there's become an over-reliance on that technology in some events. So we have to get these balances right. That that's So I love interactive technology um, for events where it's polling and platforms and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, not platforms, what's the word? Um, uh, quizzes and, you know, the ones I mean. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say any names, but those kind of things. Because they really help. You've just got to get the balance right because the last thing you want now is we've got a little bit of... Um, interest is everyone going oh, I'm on my phone now and then I get distracted and another notification and then I'm like oh god what are they talking about oh, I don't know I've lost the world to live and I'll just move on I've forgotten everything and then I'm no longer involved and then that poor speaker is up there feeling like such a spanner so that's those tech that tech is great but again it's got to be used wielded with some sense of the power it can it can have love it and um, as Bogdan mentioned in the comments if you have any questions about any of this, we still have about two, three, maybe five minutes left. <laughs> Let's see where we <laughs> go. <gonna> go. <laughs> um, so make sure to drop them in. Ob obviously, you can also just drop them in and then Claire can always, after the event, come back to your question if we didn't have the time to jump into it. Um, or if you have a question for me and Bog, then feel free to drop them as well. But we highly encourage you to facilitate in the engagement experience how it is to be an inclusive part of an event because we believe that our audience loves to be involved and we've seen quite a lot of questions already so make sure to use it we're live here so happy to answer any questions um and uh salima thank you very much for adding another nice tip in terms of making tech more accessible adding yeah. a quick video just visualizing what is actually happening is indeed also a very good way to make it more accessible so people know what to expect and know where the brake or the steering wheel is going to be like and where they can put the key. Yeah, so, and if, it, if it's a short video, absolutely a short video, I'm the same. Like, I don't know how to do something, so I type it into Google, how do I do this? And if I get a hit that's like 30-minute video, no, I'm not going to even bother watching that. If it's like a one-minute video, I think, yeah, I could give that. And oh, it's explained it to me. Then then, then that, that's exactly it. And if you can bother to make that time for your attendee, say, look, we are using a bit of technology. It's going to be there to help you. Here's how you do it. Not everybody will have looked at it, but a, certainly if a good chunk of people will. All the geeks will have done that. I loved it, wouldn't they, you guys? But no, you would be surprised. You, you'd be absolutely surprised. True. Not everybody does look at it. But then you can, it's the option. It, it's then there for you to look at and to understand. You know, we get on an aeroplane now. I don't know if you've been on an aeroplane recently. I don't go on them that often. But I went on one that was a long haul. And I hadn't been on British Airways long haul for years and the video was so good the production standards were so good and it was so entertaining that I watched it I would never normally watch those videos or I might start and then I kind of doze off or switch off because they're boring doing it that way with a little bit of production values and making it funny and interesting got me watching and you could do something funny and it, get use your MC you're paying for them to make your video hi everybody I'm going to be your MC um this is how we use the kit this is this is this and this it all 
makes you again it's that community thing we all fall part of it you're getting your money's worth but also the person coming knows that oh someone's explained it to me in layman's terms and it's just all helped me go I'm not scared of the tech I want to use the tech the biggest thing that annoys me in events is when there is this tech going to be used but it's not shared with all the people who are going to be contributing so half the contributors don't even know how to use it they didn't even know it was going to be there they didn't know people were going to be using that tech the event host maybe has not been understood it there are various AVs not been told that's needed to be done and they need to be able to sort of maybe integrate it into their systems. That's when it goes wrong because people have gone, got that bit of tech, but it's not relevant to them. So I don't need to show it to them. I don't know why they think that. And then you haven't got your whole team being part of that investment and that integration of tech. Okay. Uh, speechless. Oh. <laughs> speechless. No, absolutely speechless. You're always speechless when I talk to you. Well, no, I know, I know. I get flustered very <laughs> quite a lot. I think it's what, what you're going through there. And uh, I would just like to add that a picture can do much better than a video. There are just for the yeah. my geekiness, uh, I mentioned specifically geeks that don't watch instruction videos because we they think they know it. Don't know, of course. <laughs> it's, I've done this so many times. <laughs> Like turning on the computer and plugging in on mic or making the camera work five minutes before the show. It's, I've done this so many times. Why should I watch a video from that perspective? Um, uh, a picture is usually good. And one of the things that I've seen, again, looking at data and how interactive is um, when you go into a new software, I don't know if you notice that you have you have to go through a kind of an onboarding, mm -hmm. which you can skip the second time. But it says, look, press here for networking, press here for this, press here for this, save this button, save this button. It usually takes about 30 seconds. You usually have a next button and everybody goes next, next, but it walks you through the uh, app platform, whatever that is, relatively quickly. It gives you enough insight so you know where to go as next steps because not everything looks alike. And it's quite useful as well from my perspective. Yeah, and there's but, so many things to do, isn't there? Yes. The the piece that I loved was at one of those giant events recently when they had like um like the city map perversion of getting around the the site and actually yes. it didn't and it actually took you around the outside which probably would have really annoyed all the suppliers but if you needed to get somewhere in a hurry and you're a contributor or you're someone who's speaking you could you could actually find because I don't dread to think how many people don't turn up at their speaking engagements because they couldn't find their way there like somewhere like ibtm or somewhere how would you find your way around so the, having that on the app was really valuable but then again you don't need that on every you only need it on the big events um okay, yes so very true and i love that miguel neves actually uh shared a post about someone who created a these are my favorite spots to eat and hang around around mm. the venue it you know it has a whole other layer to it and yeah, of course, you prefer to have people in the venue, but for those that want to get out or after the event want to get something to drink, if you can support them there as well, it makes it even a better experience for them. It all kind of adds up. Uh, but this is the, this is it. It's not, I think so long events have been about how to make the event planners life easier, which is great. Obviously, we, we care that they're our clients, but actually, we just got to take it back to how to make the attendees life better. Because if the attendees happier, and their life is easier, and everything's more enjoyable for them, then they are much more likely to do what you wanted them to do as a result of coming to the event. And then ultimately, everybody's life's easier who's been involved. It's kind of that's where I'm about. So again, any tech that helps the attendee have a better time is going to help me ultimately. It's going to help everyone involved in the event. Love it. I was kind of going to ask you for a key takeaway, but I think this is it. <laughs> like, say no more. I think this is something where people that people can take with them. And indeed, uh, if your attendee is at the center of things, then they will also come back next year, which helps you a yeah. lot. Um, because you're only as good as your last event, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, All right. Speaking, we can do this in four words. So it's emotion, engagement, communication, and then everybody needs a clear, correct? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing my husband's left the room so he'd make such a rude comment then, but yes, no. <laughs> and that, that point I just raised, then it raised that because I am starting a podcast called Not the Same as Last Year. And I was trying to explain in a pithy, intelligent way why I'm obsessed by this attendee kind of focus. 
attendee first, I'm calling it, I'm not, that's not me labeling it, that's a, a term that's been used, but why it literally is, if you do that, everything kind of works. Very true. We are looking forward to that. <laughs> 15th of April. 15th of April. I can't even tell you where to go because there's nowhere to go yet. But yeah, listen out for that on the 15th of April in all the podcasty places. All right. Awesome. Uh, I still see uh, Sabrina I oh, always yeah. uh, wow. have a VIP coordinator to keep track of speakers. Very good point as well. Uh, and Bob uh, also mentioning as events get bigger and bigger, interactive floor maps are essential. Some good tips from the audience. Thank you all for pitching in. I see we've flown through time, so indeed it's a good uh, kind of way to end things. I think there were a lot of insights that people can take with them. Um, if you uh, like, share your favorite takeaway in the comments uh, or ask some additional questions so we can come back to them later. Claire, I want to give you a huge thank, uh, thank you and a virtual hug in that regards uh, for, for being here. It was such a pleasure having your insights and knowledge uh, and we couldn't be more excited. To, to have you on today. I think it was a, a very good session. If I say so myself, I might be a little bit biased. <laughs> Thank um, you. I, I loved I, it. I, I love chatting to you boys. You know I do. Um, so um, I look forward Thank to you. seeing you both in person as soon as possible. And obviously it'll probably be in the Fox. So Absolutely. <laughs> yes, please and thank you. Yes. <laughs> and and for those of you who would like to get in touch with Claire with all her knowledge, she shares an awful lot of very insightful post around this topic on LinkedIn. So make sure to share or to follow her, connect with her on LinkedIn, um, watch her YouTube videos. She is also there. Um, very insightful. I always very much enjoyed them. Visit her website, get ready to follow her podcast as she just mentioned, not the same as last year. I am very excited about it because I'm done with all the events that are exactly the same as last year. So keep your eyes out. It launches the 15th of April. So if you follow her, you'll probably get a notification. We'll drop her LinkedIn uh, URL in the comments here. But for those who are listening to the recording, you'll find them in the show notes uh, below this episode, kind of the description of this podcast or YouTube video uh, as well. So you can make sure to follow and connect with Claire. Um, obviously, if you need an MC at your next event, mm -hmm. she's also the person you always to go need to. An MC at your next event. What do you mean? Uh, it, you I mean, need... if you don't have one yet already, <laughs> <laughs> then make sure to get Claire because she's going to blow away your audience and make sure they actually feel seen, feel part of the event and want to come back next year. And as you have seen, she's more than happy to jump in and help you out on the strategy side as well. All right. I think uh, besides an announcement for next week, because we're going to do another tech assessment and we actually have another expert on board. Um, then yeah, I'm, it's, I'm sure it's somebody that I I re, I I'm I'm fascinated with because I've worked with him quite a lot. Uh, I was I almost said Adam Perry, but it, I, I'm fascinated by him as well. <laughs> it's Adam Price, who is the growth architect. It's so so much fun to talk to him. I'm really looking forward to hearing his his thoughts. He's a magician when it comes to CRMs, points of data integrations, and uh, Lucid charts, which is something fantastic. If you haven't tried it, it's like an infinite data thing where you can put things on a whiteboard. It's slightly almost as good as mirror boards. But anyway, you will be here next week at 3 p.m. with uh, Adam. You can find this episode on YouTube and wherever you find your podcast or listen to your podcast. If you do, if you don't start doing that, just because Claire is going to launch one, not because of us. <laughs> and uh, so do the accounts bits and uh, we shall see you next week. Thank you very much, Claire. It was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. And I'm pressing See you at the next one. See you at the next All right. one. Happy days, everyone. Bye-bye.